Well, I think we're all started. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this is the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, Beginner's Guide to Identifying Butterflies. And today I will be the speaker, which is super exciting. Often I am the host. So it's great to have everyone here today with me. We also have Catherine with me today, who is the high school teacher and education program manager. Uh, Catherine will be helping me out with bringing any questions from the chat bar or any discussion notes um, to me as well. So thank you, Catherine, for being here too. Glad to be here. Thanks, Stephanie. So before we get started, I just want to mention that all of our July programs are now live on our website, and we have some more programs that go even into October. Um, all of those are virtual at the moment, but we are looking into doing in-person events. So on your screen now, you should see an entire calendar of events for July, and anything that's highlighted in yellow are programs that are still available and you can sign up for. So please sign up for as many programs as you'd like. Um, we're easing our way back into in-person events that adhere to public health guidelines, and we'll be offering um, outdoor yoga, meditation, and forest bathing events through July to September. Spaces are limited, um, so register for as many sessions that are available for you right now. Um, we do have forest bathing tomorrow. It's completely filled full up filled up, sorry. <laughs> um, but we do have some more coming in August. Um, so please check our website for that. We do have meditation on Sunday and Tuesday we have yoga too. So sign up for as many as you were interested in. Uh, and if you would like to support our virtual and on-site programs and as well as conservation of Riverwood's habitat and wildlife, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. We would greatly appreciate any sort of contribution during these times. So thank you so much. And the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. So if you have any questions today, or if I ask you a question and you want to answer them, you can put them in the chat bar or the Q&A section if you are watching from Zoom. And you can also put it in the chat bar on Facebook, though we may not get to all the questions that come out on Facebook. It's just so many things to look at at once. Um, uh, so please put in any questions that you do have. And the reason why I'm doing this program today, uh, if you don't already know, CBC or Credit Valley Conservation is doing their annual butterfly blitz. Uh, so it's through the month of May to September. So you still have a couple more months to join. It will be on iNaturalist. And basically what you do is you go out in the Credit River watershed. Um, that includes Mississauga area. That includes Riverwood. Um, and you go and take pictures of any butterflies you see and you record them to iNaturalist, which is really cool. So there's a bunch of people that are already involved in this awesome bio blitz. Um, so as you can see here, this is actually the screen that shows this is iNaturalist. And if you've never been on there before, I highly recommend it. It is my all time favorite app. So right now there's 135 joined um, in the Credit Valley um, Conservation Butterfly Blitz. There's 59 different species seen in this area, which is crazy how many different kinds of butterflies they are. So I may be in over my head during this program today, but I'll try to keep up. Um, and then there's uh, 113 people that have actually um, identified different butterflies. So here's some of the images that people have taken uh, within the last day, actually. And they don't have to be high definition, as you can see. A lot of these are blurry images, but that's perfect. That's okay. It is hard to take pictures of butterflies because they are just flittering around. They're very frantic. Um, and so what you basically do is you take an image of any kind of butterfly, you um, post it into iNaturalist, and iNaturalist will actually scan that photo for you and they will suggest uh, the closest identification of that species for you. So it eliminates having to go through actually a field guide, um, though I do think this usually you learn more when having to go through a field guide, but 
it does save you that kind of task and it will try to identify that species for you and you can submit it. iNaturalist is not only for butterflies though, you can use it for anything. You can use it for tracks and scat, which is always funny. I always like to tell people you can take pictures of poop on the ground and it will try to identify what species that came from. It will identify any kind of mammal, bird, anything like that. So plants as well. So I really suggest getting on there and joining this BioBlitz. And here's a map of all of the areas that uh, people have identified different butterfly species. There's lots of areas that are still missing. So if you're in any of these areas here, make sure to go on out and check if you can find any of the butterflies. And another really great resource before we jump right into it today, Butterflies of Ontario is a website and it really breaks down our five different butterfly families for you and makes it super simple to understand. I really suggest going on this website if you have like questions or if you have an image of a butterfly and you don't really, you can't really understand it in your field guide, you know, iNaturalist isn't identifying it properly, you can always um, go on this website and it has a really great way of breaking down the different families and the different species as well. So let's jump right into it. Let's start with the very, very basics. The two, um, the two kind of insects that we're looking at right now is a moth and a butterfly. And sometimes you can, you can have troubles distinguishing between the two. They do look quite similar. So I'm just have a question for everybody watching right now. Which one is the butterfly and which one is the moth? What one on the left? What is the one on the left? And what is the one on the right? And how do you know? How do you know? Is there anything coming in the chat yet, Catherine? There is. Um, let's see. Um, Stacy says left equals butterfly, right equals moth with the fuzzy antenna. Uh, Linda thinks the butterfly is on the left. And Michaela says the right is the moth with hairy antenna. So it looks like a lot of people in the chat have the same idea. That's awesome. So everyone's already experts. We're starting the very basics, but everybody already seems to know this stuff. So that's awesome. Great job, everyone. So this one is the butterfly. It often has these long antenna with kind of like a ball in the end or a club, I like to say. So long, and then there's always this little thicker club-like part on the very end of the butterfly antenna. And like all of you said, the fuzzy antenna here, they kind of look like feathers when you look at them close up. They are the moth. So great job, everyone. So here we have a butterfly. This is our red admiral, and you can see those antenna with the club like on the very end. And then as well, we have our Luna moth and it's feather-like antenna. And this is why I say they are hard to distinguish because a lot of times people assume that moths are very bland and drab and they're not very colorful, but that is not the case. There are many moths that are brightly colored and beautiful, just like this Luna moth. And there's many butterflies that are just plain gray and brown. So color isn't always the greatest way to distinguish between moth and butterfly. A, a better way is to look at their antenna. Another really key feature too, is that often butterflies hold their wings vertically up. So they close their wings. That's what makes it so hard to identify them sometimes. Um, I'm sure some of you have tried to take a, a picture of a butterfly before and it opens its wings slowly and then closes them really quick as you're trying to take a picture of the wings open. Um, butterflies commonly sit on these flowers with their wings closed. And whereas moths, if you ever see a moth land, it usually has its wings open. They're covering the abdomen. It's kind of like a tent-like feet. So that's another really quick identifier of the difference between these two butterflies and, sorry, between butterflies and moths. And another really, really good identifier is obviously the time of day or night you are seeing these creatures. So as you can see, butterflies are mostly diurnal, so they fly during the daytime when the sun is out. That isn't the case for all butterflies. Um, and then most of the moths are nocturnal, so they fly at night. Once again, not the case for all moths, but that is a, a good uh, identifier for those two. 
Now, if you want to look um, closer at maybe a cocoon or a chrysalis that you found and how do you distinguish whether it's a moth or how do you distinguish whether it is a butterfly. So moths, for the most part, I'm going to be saying that a lot. For the most part, the majority of moths create something called a cocoon, which I'm sure everyone's heard that term before. And this is actually something that they spin around them. So for the most part, it is silk that the um, moth caterpillar spins this silk around their entire body. And that's actually how they transform into a moth. Whereas our butterfly species, they go into something called a chrysalis. Um, not a cocoon. So chrysalis is actually part of their body. So I like to think of it as if you were to hang up a banana and then the banana peel starts to open. So that's kind of like how our butterflies do it. So the, the banana peel is their exoskeleton, their skin. So um, the caterpillar kind of peels open at the top and it drops its exoskeleton, it sheds that exoskeleton and underneath that shed comes out the chrysalis. So it's actually part of their body. The chrysalis is the butterfly. Whereas with the cocoon, it's just a spin of silk around it. So those are two ways that you can kind of distinguish between the two. And if you find a cocoon or chrysalis in nature, that, those are two kind of key identifiers. Another thing is their larval stage as caterpillars. So one great way to identify whether it is a moth or a butterfly is if they are fuzzy, they are definitely not a butterfly. So this one here is a moth. Um, not, none of our species have this fuzziness like this. This fuzziness is so that the, the moth caterpillar doesn't get eaten. So if they're fuzzy, it's a moth. On the opposite side, if it's smooth, it can be either a moth or a butterfly. So that's a little bit harder. So as you can see, like I said, the fuzziness, it's definitely a moth. So if you do see a fuzzy caterpillar, that's an easy identifier that it's not a butterfly. But if it's smooth, it can be either. So you can't kind of distinguish the two as smooth and fuzzy. So why I say that is this one here, this is actually a sphinx moth and it's pretty smooth. So you may think it's a butterfly, but this one's actually a moth. Now, I'm just wondering, does anyone in the chat know what these two caterpillars are? They're pretty common. You can see them quite often. Anyone know what this moth caterpillar is? And does anyone know what this butterfly caterpillar is? Can anyone identify either of these? And Catherine, I wonder if you can let me know if there's anyone in the chat that knows what species these are. You've got lots of guesses coming in. Heather says there is a woolly bear caterpillar. And Michaela says woolly bear and monarch. Uh, let's see. Uh, what Jason is wondering if the left one could be a tiger moth. So there are some good guesses here in the chat. Lots of ideas being shared here. And Anita wonders if the right could be a swallowtail. Ah, nice. Okay, thank you so much, Catherine. Looks like we have a lot of experts in the chat right now, which makes me a little bit nervous. <laughs> So yeah, this is a woolly, well, commonly called a woolly bear caterpillar. Um, it does turn into a tiger moth. It turns into an Isabella tiger moth. So great job on identifying that. This one's often seen in the fall. It has this really, really dark coloration to it, the black and the dark orange. And this is because this caterpillar spends so much of its time basking and attracting as much sunlight that it can to keep warm. It's usually seen in the fall, so it gets a little bit cooler. So they have these dark colors so that it can stay warm. And then you are exactly right with identifying this one here. It is a monarch caterpillar, um, one of my favorite caterpillars. It looks just so cool and I love watching them on milkweed plants. It does look similar to a swallowtail um, caterpillar and unfortunately I don't have an image of the swallowtail caterpillar, but um, I'll be talking a little bit more about how, how to identify between the two adult species as well. So great job, everyone. 
So there are um, many ways and many different stages that our butterfly species go through. So now we're kind of transitioning. We know the difference between a moth and a butterfly. We're now transitioning into just strictly butterflies. And there's many different stages that our butterflies go through um, in their life cycle. So we have an egg, we have the larval uh, caterpillar, we have the pupa, which is in a chrysalis, and then we have the adult butterfly as well. Today, we're mainly focusing on just the adult butterfly, um, but I would be happy to come back and do it just specifically on maybe the caterpillar or the chrysalis because all of them have different features. That's what makes um, learning about butterflies so much fun is that there's so many ways you can identify them and it's it can get challenging, but in a good way. <laughs> so the first thing you want to do is to get a good field guide for yourself. Um, I suggest smaller field guides. And the reason I say this is because when you're out in the field and you have a ginormous butter, butterfly um, field guide, it can not only weigh you down, but it can be kind of um, overwhelming and discouraging. So a really great one that I use is the National Audubon Society uh, Familiar Butterflies of North America. Super small and it doesn't show all the butterflies, but it just gives some features and some of the familiar or common butterflies that you can find. Very small and easy to use. And I suggest using something small if you're beginning because I have done, I have made a mistake before. I started identifying moths a while ago and I got the biggest moth book possible. I, I don't remember what the, the name was, but it was huge. And I just could not even use it because it was so big. I wasn't gonna go through all the pages. I felt overwhelmed by how many different species there are. So start up small and find a book that really resonates with you and you'll enjoy it a lot more, trust me. Um, even trying out with iNaturalist first is a good first step into identifying butterflies. One thing I will say that I like more is drawings of butterflies. So here's a, sorry, I know I have my screen showing, but hopefully you can see. Here's um, a golden guide to butterflies and moths. It's quite old, this guide, but as you can see, they're drawings instead of pictures, and I commonly like the drawing field guides more, and the reason why I say this is because when you have a field guide that has images, like this one, often the image is of the pristine, best looking um, butterfly that you can find. The best image in the best lighting, um, the most colorful. So I really like the drawings because they show the variations. Butterflies vary a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And to just have an image of a butterfly that's in its pristine coloration, it can be difficult because you could be looking at this, but you could be seeing a butterfly that has ripped off underwings and it's pretty drab and a lot of its scales are removed, the coloration on it's removed. So I really like field guides that have drawings in them because it shows all the different variations that this butterfly can come into and it helps you identify what you're really looking for um, in a drawing. So that's just a couple of my suggestions. Um, start out small is it's probably the biggest suggestion that I would give you because I've made that mistake many, many times. The next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to under, want to understand how to classify butterflies and that's what we're going to kind of do today. And so Classification is really important when you're using a field guide, because if you're out there and you know specific classifications, like the family of the butterfly that you're looking at, it makes it really quick to just flip to the back, find where that family is, and then find it and flip through the different species that are under that family. So I'll explain that a little bit more. So let's take this monarch butterfly as an example. Kingdom is Animalia, so the animal kingdom. The phylum is arthropoda. So arthropods are invertebrates that have an exoskeleton. So this can be sea creatures, insects, anything like that. Anything that has an exoskeleton that's an invertebrate. The class is insecta. So insects, what makes an insect an insect? It has three body parts. So the head, thorax, and abdomen. It has six legs, so uh, three pairs of legs. It has com compound eyes and a pair of antenna. 
The order is Lepidoptera. Um, Lepidoptera is the order that um, contains butterflies and moths in it. So both butterflies and moths. And then the family is Nymphalid. I, I can never say this one. Nymphalida, I hope. <laughs> so this is brush foot. So that's probably the most important first step into understanding what you're looking at in the field. So we know when we're seeing something up close, we know we can already skip to the order. Here, let me get the, let me get my little highlighter up here. So we already know we can skip right to order, Lepidoptera. We know that right away, it's a butterfly or it's a moth. If you can start to identify the family that you're looking at based on the characteristics, that is an easy first way to understanding what you're looking at. So Nymphalida, which is brush foots, is what a monarch butterfly is in. Genus is Danus. Species is Danus plexippus. So that's what the uh, direct species is, is a monarch butterfly. But many times you see a butterfly and you can't just skip right to species. You have to go first to the family to understand um, more about that. Catherine, I'm wondering, is there any questions in the chat about this? Because I'm going a little bit quickly, but I want to make sure that I'm answering any questions that are coming up. Thanks. I think this is so helpful, Stephanie. I really like the way you've walked through uh, the classification right down to the species level. And I don't see any questions in the chat so far, but okay. um, people are finding this very interesting. And um, Heather noted that it's so helpful to look at photos versus drawings. And it's really an interesting way to learn about variations between those species and uh, taking note of damage that can happen right. to the butterflies over time. And there's also a question actually that's just come in asking if there are clues to identify the family. And we are going to get right into that. That's awesome. So I go, I'm glad that there's not many questions. That hopefully means that I'm, You're doing I'm a great job. explaining this okay. <laughs> so um, thank you, Catherine. We're going to explain quickly about uh, kind of key features we're going to be looking for, and then we'll get right into the families and how to kind of dwindle it down to those specific families. So one thing we can look at is the size. So families of butterflies often have different sizes, and we're going to be going through what each family size is. So is it small, is it medium, or is it large? And sometimes this helps, not all the time. I'll explain that a little bit later on. For example, skippers are generally really small butterflies. So that's a great key feature. But when I talk about monarch butterflies and they're in the family brushfoots, brush-footed butterflies are very variable with their size. So size doesn't always help you here. But that is kind of a first step. So take that first step. The next one is color. Coloration can help you a lot and it, it distinguishes between species as well. Um, I will be showing some of the basic colors that each of the families has as well. And then shape. So shape is another really great feature. As you can see, these both seem like similar shaped butterflies. There are a couple differences here. We have the monarch butterfly and then a swallowtail. But as you can see, down here on its underwing, it has these long tail-like features. So the shape is another really good distinguisher between the species uh, or the families as well, which we'll, we'll dive into in a second. And where to find these butterflies. So these are all images taken yesterday at Riverwood. Um, the, they were sent to me by Carrie, who is our enabling garden coordinator. And she just took these over the day. Um, so we have really large gardens at Riverwood and there's so many butterflies there right now. And especially on the coneflowers. The coneflowers are like full in bloom right now. And there are just bees, butterflies, anything you can think of drinking the nectar on these um, on these uh, um, flowers. So a good way to kind of find the spots where you're going to find butterflies. Um, butterflies are mostly eating and mating and laying eggs. They always tend to stick towards what they eat, what food source they eat, what the caterpillar eats, and what the butterfly eats. So 
often really um, great areas are kind of edge habitats that are between fields and forest and have lots of wildflowers. Um, all of these ones here we, you see are cultivated, but some are native. And that's a really great way to actually go and see butterflies. So you can come to Riverwood today even and see a bunch of butterflies. Another great way, if you're looking for a specific kind of butterfly or a specific kind of family, is to find what the host plant of that, that butterfly is. So a lot of butterflies depend on one or a couple different host plants. And what this means is that without that plant, without that host plant, the butterfly population would not be able to survive. So for example, we have here the milkweed, my favorite, um, wildflower. So the milkweed plant is the host plant for monarch butterflies. Without milkweed, we wouldn't have monarchs. So if you're trying to look for monarchs, a good place to go is to any milkweed species of plant. And at Riverwood, we do have many milkweeds on site and there are caterpillars on them right now. And we regularly see the monarchs actually coming. They will drink the nectar, but they'll also lay the, their eggs on the milkweed so that the caterpillar can eat that. Another really great plant is the Queen Anne's Lace, and that's a great place to see where black swallowtails are. So black swallowtails love Queen Anne's Lace. So this is another flower that you can look for if you're looking for a specific butterfly. So diving deeper into what the host plant of these different butterflies are is a great way to um, try and find them too. And understanding what butterfly that is too, right? So if you see a caterpillar on a milkweed plant, you're most likely looking at a monarch caterpillar because that's its host plant. So that's another key identifier as well. Now in your field guides, it can get kind of confusing because sometimes we'll say things like the hind wing has small red dots and blue patches on the trailing edge. And you'll be like, um, I have no idea what that is. What's a hind wing? What's a trailing edge? So, um, First of all, the first is basics of the butterfly. We have the antenna, which are these two things here. We have the compound eye, which you can see here. We have the forelegs. So um, there's three pairs of forelegs right here. And then we also have the proboscis right here. So that's how they actually drink the nectar from the flowers. So those are the basics. But then we look closer at the wings and the wings are a really, really good identifier of what species you're looking at. So the upper wing right here is called the forewing. So the one that's closest to the head of the butterfly. Sorry, I have two screens. So I'm, I'm looking at my screen here and also try to talk to you guys over here. <laughs> so the forewing has a couple different features. So the base, really easy. The base is where um, the forewing attaches to the um, butterfly, the, but the body of the butterfly. It has this cell, which often is visible on butterflies, but not always. And it's kind of like this patch um, uh, in between. Open patch, sometimes it's colorful on the wing of the butterfly. With the costa, which is the top or the closest um, rim of the wing to the head. So if we're looking at this butterfly here, this would be the costa, um, the closest trailing, or I shouldn't use trailing edge, the closest edge to the head of the butterfly. And then we have tip is obviously the tip of the butterfly wing. We have the outer margin, which is the outermost uh, edge of the wing. And then we have the trailing edge, <clears throat> which is this part here. It's, it's the in-between edge, the farthest away from the head of the butterfly, if that makes sense. So if there's any questions, let me know because <clears throat> there's a lot of arrows going on here. Yeah, it's really helpful, Stephanie, to, to identify those different parts of a wing because mm -hmm. there's so much to look at. Exactly, right? The pattern, the color, the shape. So if you're trying to identify or distinguish between different types, it's really hard to think about what to focus on and having some language to describe it is super helpful. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing in the chat um, <clears throat> that there are um, lots of uh, questions that we might be able to get to a little bit later, I think, okay. um, but lots, still so much interest in what's going on. Someone has just said, this is so interesting. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, as we go along, maybe th this will come up in your presentation. People are wondering if you can tell the gender of a butterfly and they're interested in how butterfly mating takes place. And so maybe those things will come up later or at the end of your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I'm glad that everybody's following along because there's so many arrows on here <laughs> and there's going to be more arrows in a second. But for the longest time, I was reading my field guide and, you know, it would mention something like outer margin or trailing edge. And I'd be like, I have no idea what this is talking about. There's yellow spots on the outer margin and the trailing edge has black lines. I'm just, I was lost. So it's, it's important that you pick a field guide that kind of explains that. Some of them won't, but a lot of them do now. They'll, they'll show you the different parts and what they're, they're talking about. And then the hind wing is the further, the further um, wing from the head. So we have the costa, which again is the closest edge to the head for the hind wing, if that makes sense. So it's the closest to the head for the hind wing. We have the cell again, the outer margin, which is the edge that is on the outside of the wing, the trailing edge, which is the farthest edge from the head of the butterfly. And then once again, we have the base, which is where the wing actually connects to the body. So those are the parts of the wing. When you get um, a field guide or if you use iNaturalist and identify these butterflies, a lot of times they'll tell you key features on that butterfly. And they'll tell you the key features using this terminology. So it's really um, helpful if you start to learn and understand this. I even now, I still need to get reminded about where these things are. So this is still a learning curve for me because reading, I often still have to refer to something to understand where they actually are. So let's get into the first family and that is skippers. And I'm not gonna try to say the Latin name, Maybe I will. Hesperida. Hesperidae. I don't know. Somebody's going to get mad at me that I'm <laughs> not saying this correctly. I just call them skippers. Um, so skippers is the first family that we're going to be talking about today. And here's some key features about them. They're small. They often are moth-like. Many people think that these butterflies are moths when they see them, so they maybe ignore them um, and don't take images of them for things like the bioblitz because they say, oh, that's a moth. So they do look like moths, they're small, they have this kind of coloration. So they have browns, yellows, and grays. They're kind of drab looking, not to, not to offend our skipper butterflies, but they are a little bit drab looking. There's some that are really cool, but a lot of them are pretty plain looking. And the reason why they're called skippers is because how they fly, it kind of looks like they're skipping um, and they're very frantic. So here's some species of skippers that were actually seen um, during the bio blitz, the, the butterfly, bi CVC's butterfly bio blitz this year so far. Um, so they've already beat the record of skippers that they found. So these are the many different kinds of species. One thing to notice here, when you're going out and trying to identify butterflies, I think the most important thing is to try to get an image of that butterfly, especially when you're talking about skippers, because skippers move very quickly. And to try to get a photo of it is, is hard, but it will help you in identifying that species. So if you were to go out into um, the woods one day and you saw a monarch, you're pretty good at identifying a monarch. You know what they look like, you know the relative size and shape. But when there's this many different kinds of species of skippers that all look different, it's really important and helpful if you can have an image so that you can refer back to that image and then use your field guide to actually um, note any kind of characteristics that they have. This is one of my favorite uh, skippers. This is called the silver spotted skipper. And it's the e one of the easiest to identify just because it has a big white or I guess silver spot on its hind wing. It's actually the largest skipper resident in Ontario as well, so it is quite larger than the regular ones. Um, and it's a very quick and strong flyer. So this one will be hard to take an image of unless it is sitting and eat, um, drinking some nectar from a flower. 
Another one that I really love, I don't know why I love this skipper. Um, this is called a wild indigo dusky wing. So not all butterflies that are in the family of skippers have the name skipper, if that makes sense. So let's, let's go back. All of these ones here, these are all in the family of skipper and they have the name skipper on the end of it. This one here is called a wild indigo dusky wing. It's still in the family of skippers because of the features that it has. So um, it's small, it skips when it flies, it's that gray, um, that gray brownie color that all the other ones have as well. So that's one way to identify it. I just really like this kind of skipper because it's so beautiful, the dark, dark coloration of it on some of the pretty flowers like this cone flower here. So those are some ways to identify skippers. And then we have the swallowtails or papillon, pap, papillonidae. Catherine's probably laughing in the background right now. <laughs> um, so we have the swallowtails, which are beautiful butterflies. They are large butterflies. They usually have these colorations. They're usually dark. Um, or lighter. So they usually have some sort of yellow in them. They're a light yellow or almost whitey color. And then they sometimes have this really dark feature as well. I'm sure many of you have seen this swallowtail in specific. It's, it's seen a lot around Toronto and Mississauga area. This is called the black swallowtail. It loves to drink from Queen Anne's lace. So it's a host plant for the caterpillar. The caterpillar will actually eat the Queen Anne's lace. So if you do want to attract these butterflies to your backyards, that's a great flower that you can actually get. Um, one way to identify, and this kind of gets to the question of how to identify the difference between a male and a female butterfly. There are ways. Every butterfly though <laughs> is different. So they don't have this one key feature on them that says that's a male and that's a female. Um, a lot of these butterflies, they have different colorations or sizes that help you identify between the male and female. But really you have to look at that specific species to find out the difference. So I'm gonna be talking about this one right now, but also monarch and, and other butterflies and how to identify the difference. So for the most part, um, the female butterfly has more blue on her underwing. And that's one way that you can actually see um, if it's a female, she has more blue, she's slightly more blue, and the eye spots are reduced on her. So these big splotches on her are slightly reduced as well. Now, the black swallowtail actually is thought to mimic another kind of swallowtail called the pipe vine swallowtail. I don't know if anyone's heard of that one before, but pipe vine swallowtails are actually poisonous to birds and other insects and things that would eat them. So they say that the black swallowtail is trying to mimic the pipe vine so that it looks poisonous as well. But in fact, the black swallowtail is not poisonous whatsoever. And neither are its caterpillars. Probably the most common swallowtail that you will see, and I'm sure many of you have seen this as well, this is called the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Such a beautiful yellow and black um, swallowtail. Looks very similar to the Canada Tiger Swallowtail, and they do sometimes interbreed. I will say that for the most part, <laughs> there's that term again, for the most part, Eastern Tiger Swallowtails are found in this area. Um, southernmost uh, Ontario, whereas this one here, which I'm going to show you in a video in a second, is called a Canada Tiger Swallowtail, and it's found more northernly in places like Algonquin Park. And a really cool thing that you'll see these butterflies actually doing, the swallowtails and other butterflies as well, but I, I've seen swallowtails do it um, a lot, is that they'll actually feed from mud or scat or dead animals. So um, it's very windy when I was taking this video, that's why it was like tipping over. Um, but swallowtails, they arrive very early in the season, not a lot of um, flowers are available to them. And so what happens is they are drinking things like salt and water and other tasty things that are in the mud here in this case, but also you can sometimes see them on scat. Um, 
uh, any kind of scat, coyote scat, wolf scat, bear scat, these swallowtails will flock to them. And sometimes you can see like 50 of these butterflies on, on a poop um, trying to access any kind of salt or nutrients that's in that poop, which is really funny. If you're out on a trail as well, if you're really sweaty, these butterflies will sometimes land on your hand and drink some of the, the sweat off of your arms, which is kind of cool. The next one is whites and sulfurs, probably one of the most basic and easy butterflies to identify. They are usually medium in size, and these are the colors. Very bland, basic colors. Well, not bland, but basic colors and usually not too many features on the butterfly. The most common of the whites and the sulfurs is this one here. This is called a cabbage white butterfly. You probably have seen so many of these in your parks or in your backyard, or if you've come to Riverwood, they're all over the place. And they just are white butterflies. Another way to identify the difference between male and female in this butterfly, though, is that the females have an extra dot on their forewing. So on this wing right here, they have an extra dot. This is difficult to identify because usually you want their wings to be open so that you can see that extra dot that could be hiding behind their, um, their uh, underwing here. So they do have two dots in the same location and the males just have one black dot. So there's another way to identify, but like I said, it's different for every species. And this is the most common that you'll see. Uh, and then we also have the sulfurs. So this is called a clouded sulfur, really pretty, it has this pink border on the edge of the uh, wings here. And uh, clouded sulfurs are very similar looking to another kind of sulfur called an orange sulfur. And the orange sulfur is just slightly more orangey. But again, um, with wear and tear, these butterflies are quite delicate. Sometimes they're flying through storms, they try to hunker down, but sometimes they get whipped around, you know, um, things are sometimes trying to eat them. There's a lot of wear and tear that goes on with our butterfly species and their wings. Sometimes you'll see these butterflies and they'll have missing wings or like notches out of their wings and that can make it very hard to identify. The coloration on these butterflies is called scales. And if you touch a butterfly, that's that powdery stuff that comes off on your fingers. It's the scales, it's the colors of the butterflies. So orange sulfurs are usually more orange than what the, this clouded sulfur, but if these colorations are changing, that can be hard to identify. Um, you usually want to look at the different spots, the eye spots, and the characteristics that you can see using a field guide to actually identify it. But this one here is a clouded sulfur. And then we have the gossamer wings. They are usually small. They usually have some sort of blue color in them. I should have included white because not all of them have this blue coloration in them. And especially when they're sitting on a flower and they have their wings closed vertically, a lot of them just look white. Um, and then another key feature is they have eye spots. So lots of characteristics on their wings. And we'll look at that right now. So this one is a silvery blue butterfly. Super pretty. One way to identify it is it's bright blue. And when it's flying, you can almost guarantee it's silvery, silvery blue butterfly. But when it's sitting still and it closes its wing, you no longer can see that blue feature. So if you take an image, a great way is to look at its eye spots, like I talked about before. And the eye spots are these kind of black dots. A lot of butterflies have these, and this is a great way to uh, distinguish between the two um, or the different butterfly species. But we also have all of these ones as well. And these all look similar, but they're all different kinds. They're all different species of uh, butterfly under gossamer wings. So this one here is the Eastern tailed blue butterfly. Then we have the Northern azure butterfly. This one was seen yesterday. And then this one was seen last week. This is a banded hair streak butterfly. So all of them look somewhat similar. One way that I kind of distinguish them because, you know, gossamer wing, winged butterflies and um, uh, whites and sulfurs, you can kind of see the similarities. They're white, they're kind of small to medium size. One way I kind of think of this is gossamer um, butterflies, they 
they tend to have these kind of wave like features on their on their under or on their wings when they're closed. If you can see these little lines, they have a little bit more characteristics than whites and sulfurs. Whites and sulfurs are usually one color and then maybe a few features, whereas gossamer wings, they have lots of little lines and waves on them that can kind of help you distinguish between the two. Once again, get out a field guide or iNaturalist to identify the different species, especially if you're a beginner, because if you saw all of these three butterflies out in the field, you'd be like, those are the same species, but they all have slightly different characteristics that help you identify that specific species. And then my all-time favorite brush foots, um, nympho nymphalidae, nymphalidae, I hope. <laughs> so brush foots are brush footed um, butterflies. They are medium to large in size, a lot of them, um, but I won't say all, a lot of them have orangey or cream or black colors, um, but that's not all of them. This family of butterflies is so variable. There are so many different species and so many species that look the exact same and so many different colors. So this family is very difficult to identify, but there's a lot of very um, original looking butterflies as well. And the reason they're called brushfoots or brushfooted butterflies is because it looks like they have four legs. If you've ever seen a close-up of a monarch before and you've seen that it has four legs, you'd be like, but don't insects all have six legs? They do have six legs, but they have a small forewing or sort of foreleg, and it's usually kept up close to their body. So they, they're very short. Um, legs and they're usually kept up close to their body and they're very small um, and that's the same for all of the butterflies in this category. So um, if you do see a butterfly that looks like it only has four legs, it's likely in the family of brushfoot. So here we have two butterfly species. Can anyone tell me what butterfly is on your screen in the chat? Just looking at the time right now, I didn't think I'd go this long, but <laughs> I'm having fun. Can anybody tell me what species you see on your screen in the chat? So Stephanie, you're getting lots of guesses here. Miriam says monarch. Stacy says viceroy. Uh, Jude says victory on the right. Heather guesses monarch on the left. So monarch, viceroy, and then Artie is wondering perhaps if there is a tiger butterfly of some kind. So lots of comments uh, awesome. coming in with those three species. That's great. So you guys are exactly right. The one on the left here is called a monarch butterfly, like we know, like we love, like my little crown here. <laughs> and the one on the right is actually a viceroy butterfly. So key distinguishers between the two, the viceroy butterfly has this long line through its hind wing or underwing. So this long line here and the monarch butterfly does not have that. The viceroy is also quite um, small. So that's one way to identify it. It's a little bit smaller than our monarch butterfly. Now, both of these butterflies are poisonous or toxic and they do not taste good to our birds and insect species. So they are actually both mimicking each other. There's recent research that came out that they're both mimicking each other so that they're, they're more likely or less likely to be eaten by a predator, which is really cool. For the longest time, they thought the viceroy butterfly was only mimicking the monarch, but recent research came out that they're both mimicking each other. They co-evolved to um, be less likely to be eaten by predators because they're both toxic. Another key feature of identifying between a male and a female on the monarchs is this one here is a male because of these big black dots that you see on its hind wing. So if you see a black dot on the monarch butterfly, it's a male. If that's um, absent, then it's a female. We also have this one here, which is really beautiful. This is called the red spotted admiral, also known as the red spotted purple butterfly. Um, it looks similar. At, to a black swallowtail that we were talking about before looks very similar. But like we talked about, the family of swallowtails has a tail and this one does not. 
we don't see any kind of tail. It's very beautiful, larger, so it's likely a brush foot because it doesn't have that long tail that our swallowtail species do, but it does look very similar to um, the black swallowtail. Other admirals that we have, we have the red admiral here that we learned about at the very beginning, and also the white admiral. Um, obviously, the coloration difference is one way to distinguish them, but also the white admiral is, is larger than the red admiral. And always just keeping in mind as well, when we are looking at these species, is that they may look way different with their wings closed as compared to when their wings are open. So this red admiral here has its wings open, brightly colored, dark and red, but when it closes it, it has brown features on it as well, which is cool. And we can identify it as a brush foot because it has these four legs. It has six legs, but it has one, uh, two that are very tiny. More brush foot that you probably have identified before is this guy here. This is called our morning cloak butterfly. It's usually the first butterfly that you see in the springtime because they actually overwinter as adults. So this butterfly here, I took a picture of this at Riverwood early in the springtime, and it actually had hibernated under the leaf litter all winter long. And then as soon as the snow melts, they come out and they sit on a tree and they bask. They have these dark wings that can suck in as much sunlight as possible. And then here's some pictures of, from iNaturalist. Uh, these are some of the lookalikes that I'm talking about and the reason why we need field guides and uh, uh, other resources in order to properly identify them and also a great reason why to take pictures too. So these are all different species. We have the Eastern comma, the gray comma, and the question mark. These are often referred to as the punctuation butterflies or the angle wings as well. We have the Compton's tortoise shell and the American lady. All of these look very similar, but you need to look at those eye spots, the coloration, where the eye spots are, where the lines of features are, and even the outside shape of these wings too. You can see the question mark has a very sharp um, lined wing, whereas the gray comma and the eastern comma, they're more rounded. So that's a great way to identify them too. And then we also have this, this uh, subfamily too, um, which all of these have really prominent eye spots on them. So the northern pearly eye is a pretty common butterfly that you'll see, common wood nymph and little wood satyr. All of them look quite similar. Um, they're in a subfamily called Satrinine or something like that, Satrinine. Sorry if I'm getting that completely wrong, but um, they do have these eye spots, but you can see there are differences between them great way to take a picture and try to identify it later. So before we end, I'm just going to ask some questions from what we learned today. Catherine is going to put a poll up and it's basically going to say the five different family groups that we've learned today and then as well as moth. So please select which one you think this viceroy butterfly goes into what family are viceroy butterflies in and Catherine I believe will put the poll up in a second there we go oh and I can see it too which is great so what family is our viceroy butterfly in We'll wait till we get to about 75% and then, and sorry for anyone watching on Facebook. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You can type in the chat if you want on Facebook and let us know what family you think this butterfly is. Um, we're just running a quick poll to see. And I think we can end it here. It looks pretty good. Uh, we have 81% of people saying brush foots, which you are absolutely correct. Our viceroy butterfly, similar to the monarch butterfly, is in the brush footed family. They have those four legs that are obvious and then two that are quite hidden. Often they are quite large and colorful variations in colors too. So great job, everyone. So we're going to go to the next butterfly. Let's see if you can guess what this butterfly is. And Catherine will just relaunch the uh, poll for everybody so that you can guess again. I'll just move this. 
Oh, that time we're quick. Everyone's quick this time. Awesome job, everyone. Okay, Catherine, I think I think we can end this one too and show the results. It is a swallowtail. Great job, everyone. Swallowtail, once again, it has this long um, tail-like feature on the hind wing or the underwing, as you can see here. So great job. Let's go to the next one. I'm just going to try and move this pole over here. Oh, he doesn't want to go over there. Oh, okay. What is this one? What family is this one in? And Catherine, is the poll um, blocking the image for you guys or can you see it okay? I can see the image and the poll. Okay. And I hope that's true. If, if others are having trouble, they can let us know in the chat. Perfect. Uh, I see a couple of people say, Heather said she didn't see the poll and Lisa said the image was blocked. Yeah, okay. So I think the poll, the poll is in the way. Okay. If I can somehow move this. Sorry, everyone. Artie says, uh, if I pronounce the name properly, they, that that person can see both. Okay, I moved the poll, so everyone should be able to see it now. There Good may job, be something Stephanie. blocking it. Yeah. Okay, and that's awesome. So I see this one's a little bit more split. We have 60% of people saying skipper, and we have 20% saying moth, question mark. So great job to the majority. This is a skipper. This is the wild indigo dusky wing skipper that I was talking about before. Remember, moths have those feather-like antennas. That's a really key way of looking at them. This one has kind of like that club on the end of the antenna. And as well, there it's a skipper. It's small, it's gray, brown colors. Often you can immediately think skipper. So great job. So we can end that poll and we'll restart a new one. We just have a couple more. So let's restart. This one's hard, but remember it has these waves on it. it has these waves. Do you remember who had the waves on it? More characteristics on the wings. Ooh, this one's 50-50. These are often the hardest to identify. Okay, I think we can show the results. This is pretty 50-50 right now. So 50% of people are saying gossamer wings and 50% of people are saying whites and sulfurs. Those of you that said gossamer wings are correct. That is a hard one to see for sure. Now, like I said, the gossamer wings, they have slightly more features on their wings. They have these kind of wavy features. And this one's called a northern azure. So um, great job, everyone. The whites and the sulfurs are a little more plain. But let's see if we can get the next one. So if you want to, there, perfect, Catherine's on it. So let's see, what's this butterfly? This is our second last one and then we can take some questions. I know I'm looking at this time, it's, I'm having too much fun. I do see some people saying brush foots. Take a look at the feet again though. Take a look at how many legs they have. Okay, Catherine, I think we can end this one. Okay. And everyone is correct. It's a white or a sulfur. And this one here is a clouded sulfur butterfly. So once again, very um, sulfurs are really easy to identify because they're bright, bright, bright yellow. And there's not lots of characteristics on it. It's usually just one solid color. So good job, everyone. And then the last one for today, can anyone identify what family this is in?
Woohoo! <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, that's that's probably great. Um, we stumped one person who said it was a whites and sulfur. I wasn't as tricky as I thought it was going to be. This is a moth, you're right, and this is a species of tiger moth. And as you can see, the antenna is the immediate giveaway with those feather-like antenna and also holding its wings down and, and um, in a tent-like feature instead of holding it vertically up like our butterfly species. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Riverwood is introducing a pollinator garden soon. It's in the works right now, right outside of Chapel Lawn. Right now it is dirt, but it is soon to be a pollinator garden. So we're really, really excited about um, this next task. And um, we're excited to see all the butterflies and bees and different things that come to uh, this garden, which is super exciting. And, and hopefully for next year's CBC Butterfly Blitz, um, you'll be able to just go to this pollinator garden and take pictures of so many different species there, which is really awesome. So thank you so much, everyone. Once again, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at Riverwood. Um, my email details are right on the screen right now. So if you do want to contact me or have any further questions, I would be happy to take them. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. And it's really, it's been a very long presentation. So I apologize for taking so long, but I wonder if there's any other questions. Catherine, that you saw that you think that we should address before um, we go? So there are a couple of things, Stephanie. Um, so Stacy noted that you didn't have um, a caterpillar picture for the black swallowtail. So she sent one along to share. Oh, awesome. So I don't know if you'd like to see uh, that photograph. I would love to see it. That's great. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen so that you can... Uh, Let's see. I'm just going to move the chat out of the way. Stephanie, can you see that caterpillar Aww, picture? Oh, nice. So that's so wonderful when members of the community share uh, what they have. Um, so Stephanie, this is different than the monarch caterpillar? Yeah, wow. Well, you can see, like, it looks very similar to the monarch caterpillar, eh? Like, it's crazy the, the identifying um, features of them with those yellow and, and the black and the white almost. But the spots are a key feature on this. As you can see, there's spots all the way down and the monarch doesn't really have that. So that's really cool. It's an awesome photo too. It really is great. So I thought that was really wonderful that right away um, someone from the community wanted to share. And yeah, there, was an excellent, there was an excellent question too, Stephanie. Um, Heather wondered if butterflies are affected by pesticides that are put down on the land, um, on the soil, and that perhaps are collected in runoff water. Right. And yes, absolutely. The answer is yes. Um, that's one of the reasons why we saw a big decline in monarch butterflies, and specifically because of pesticide usage. Um, not only will it affect the butterflies if they are Butterflies drink, just like you and me, they drink water if they're drinking that water, but it, it majorly impacts the food that they're eating, the plants, the flowers. Um, these plants are declining because of things like pesticides. Within recent years, though, there's been a lot of less pesticide usage, especially in agricultural practices. There's been a decline in that, and we have been seeing more of these wildflowers popping back up, and the population is, um, I, I, I wouldn't say climbing in any means, but it is, um, there's more wildflowers for them to um, access. So pesticides are not always um, the greatest use um, or the greatest thing for our butterflies, for sure. Mm -hmm. It impacts them and their host plants and other nectar feeding plants too. So interesting. So it's something to think about when watching butterflies who are puddling and mm -hmm. water from the mud and right. know, after a rain that um, maybe it's not just rain but whatever we put down on the land um, is going to be part of that um, the food and the water that they drink exactly oh, great question yeah, Stephanie do you have one more time for one more question yeah absolutely there's a question, there's a question from Facebook which, okay. I, I have, which is do you have a favorite butterfly do I have a favorite butterfly um Okay, I would like to say monarch because monarchs are like the best butterflies, but the coolest butterfly I think 
that I've ever seen is a harvester and it eats meat. It's a crazy butterfly. It's, it will eat other butterflies. It's insane. Just look it up. I didn't put it in the presentation, but it's a really neat one. And I know one person found it in the CBC butterfly um, bio blitz, which is so crazy. It's a really interesting butterfly. Amazing. Good question. Well, so, so that's going to be my homework today. And uh, Maria, uh, Maria asked how you learned about all of this, which I think is such a great question. So probably we've all learned so much from your presentation today and would just love to keep that learning going. So how did you start your butterfly learning journey? And do you have any tips for us on going forward, like a favorite starter field guide? Yes, okay, so I started by just taking images and posting them to iNaturalist. Like I said, I've made the mistake before of getting a huge field guide and Honestly, that's not helpful in any means. Um, the way I get into it, taking images and then finding a small field guide and just flipping through it and, and looking at the different images. But not only field guides, field guides are great, but there's so many web resources now available that are just so easy and quick and you can just flip through these images and it's just really helpful. Um, the one that I posted at the start of my presentation is really helpful for local uh, butterflies. Let me just go back up. I think it's called OntarioButterflies.com. Butterflies of Ontario. So that has really great specifics to butterfly families and the different species. Um, there's also Bug Guide. I don't know if you guys, it's Bug Guide, right, Catherine? The, the one that iNaturalist links you to, it's Bug That's Guide. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's Bug Guide, and then there's also um, iNaturalist, which you can post a picture of a butterfly, and there'll be experts in that field that will suggest um, identifications and why they think it's that specific species. Honestly, this journey is not like a sit down and you learn everything at once. I'm still learning so much about butterflies. Like, I still have to like look at my field guide or like look through my phone to identify it. Uh, a butterfly. Sometimes I don't even know the family. And it's really fun just to learn slowly and just see butterflies and just learn at a good pace and talk to people um, on site and staff members too at the Riverwood Conservancy that just know so much about different insects. So um, yeah, I don't know if that was a good answer. It's, it's all session. over the place. It's a long journey. <laughs> It's really inspiring. I feel very inspired by what you shared, and I'm so excited to keep my learning going. I was out over the last three days myself, learning to take photos of those uh, tricky to film, tricky to capture butterflies, and it was just so much fun. So, um, thank you for continuing the inspiration. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm just looking at the time. We've spent a long time together. So once again, if you guys do have any questions for me, you can email direct, me directly. So it's stephanie.keeler at the riverwoodconservancy.org and I can take any of those questions. And Catherine, thanks so much again for helping in the question and comment section. That helps a lot. <laughs> and um, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much, everyone. Goodbye.